everyone, and welcome to our live stream with author Sun, Sun Young Shin, Shin, sorry, Sun Young Shin, um, the author and of uh, multiple texts, but we're going to be focusing tonight on what we hunger for. Um, just welcoming you, I'm Marian Diaz, the director of Wisdom Ways, and we're so excited to have you with us, and um, thanks for joining us this, this evening. Um, I'll do a brief introduction, and then we're going to open it up for some really interesting um, conversation. So, Sun Young Shin was born in Seoul, Korea, and was raised in the Chicago area. She is a poet, writer, and cultural worker. She is the editor, as I said, of What We Hunger For, Refugee and Immigrant Stories on Food and Family and also um, an editor of A Good Time for the Truth, Race in Minnesota. She is the author of poetry collections. Um, there's four at this point. And co-editor of Outsiders Within, writing on transracial adoption, and author of a bilingual illustrated book for children, Cooper's Lesson. She lives in Minneapolis where she co-directs the community organization Poetry Asylum uh, with poet Su Huang. So I'm just so excited. I um, was really happy to hear that you're going to be willing to do this for us and with us and have this conversation. Um, I myself, you know, being a director of a spirituality center, just do a lot of a lot of reading professionally. And sometimes I get to the point where I just don't want to read and I'm just done. And as I was reading this, I think, you know, probably the team could hear me gasping and sighing and laughing and crying um, all the way. And I'm like, this, it's just such, um, it was, it was a, a pleasure, but in a deep sense to read and the fullness of meaning that comes out in, in these stories. So i um, just really excited to try to just begin to scratch the surface of unpacking um, what's represented here. Thank you, Marianne. I'm so yeah. happy to talk to you about yeah. our book. Yeah. So do you want to just start by sort of telling the story about like how did this come into being? Mm -hmm. Yes, mm -hmm. um, thank you. It really started um, with Diane Wilson's essay in this book, A Good Time for the Truth. And so Diane Wilson is Dakota. She's um, an award-winning memoirist. She had a beautiful novel come out recently. She has um, worked for many years on native food sovereignty and seed saving and working with young native kids and youth um, on teaching them how to grow things and grow traditional foods. And so her essay is the last one in a good time for the truth, it's seeds for seven generations. And um, just working with her for the first time throughout this book, which came out in 2016, was really, was really life-changing um, and really brought me forward in my political education around um, the land that we're on and uh, the Dakota people and, um, also thinking through just the role of food in justice. Mm -hmm. And um, after this book came out and after we did, you know, we continue to do readings and events around it, but I really started to think about, well, what's my next uh, regional anthology that mm -hmm. I want to do? Because mm -hmm. for some reason, I mean, I just really love anthologies and um, even though there are labors of love to to put together, it's just really gratifying. So I, I thought about things that, to me, distinguished um, the immigrants and refugee folks or the people from immigrant and refugee families that I know here in Minnesota, and what were some things about those stories and ways of relating that felt to me like untold or less mm -hmm. could we needed more mm -hmm. I wanted I personally just wanted more mm -hmm. stories it's not that mm -hmm. they're completely untold but I think haven't been given the attention that they deserve and that we all deserve to to read and engage in mm -hmm. 
um, especially as, as even in the Twin Cities, as it's become more and more uh, well known for its food scene. And, oh, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. as there have been more prominent food writers of color like Samin Nasrat and all the issues all the issues um, that we talked about or wrote about in A Good Time for the Truth, racism, colonialism, classism, um, all these intersections that impact people's lives and health and, and spirit, um, they seem to all also run through, you know, our food practices. Mm -hmm. So that is a long-winded beginning to the answer yeah, to that no, question. That's good, perfect. But and and so that's I tried to relay a lot of that in the introduction too of like why do we need this book yeah. and why is it important? If anyone needed convincing, I think a lot of people didn't need convincing, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. and so I took it to the press and since there the press is charged the uh, the um, Minnesota Historical Society press's charge is to be a steward of history mm -hmm. in this state, um, I knew that this would be a good project and they loved it. They were very excited. Um, and yeah, we just went right from there. Mm -hmm. That's great. I appreciate it. So um, can you talk a little bit just about the process, you know, of sort of selecting mm -hmm. the people who were going to be contributing? And mm -hmm. um, I just, one of the things that I love about the richness of it is that just people approached it in, such, in just their own particular way, right? Mm -hmm. So we have different like forms of writing in here and, and just it seems like perhaps they got very general direction, which is great because they're just speaking their own story, telling their own stories and, you know, including recipes and poetry and, uh, and narratives. It's, it's an expression of what you said, like that narrative plenitude, I think was the phrase mm -hmm. in that opening section of just really wanting to find a great representation of different people in Minnesota who had the experience of immigration to, mm -hmm. to share around this, so. Yeah, thanks yeah. for that question. Um, mm -hmm. I really thought for a long time before, kind of the art of the, what I think is a good anthology is just thinking through for a long time before you ask for, yeah. for submissions. You know, how, um, how will this be different than other books? Mm -hmm. How do I want readers and the writers themselves to be surprised or have room for surprise, room for play, room yeah, to that. be, uh -huh. you know, not just, okay, um, tell us, you know, your saddest story mm -hmm. or tell us, you know, your most, your most immigranty story of all your immigrant, <laughs> you know, it's like there's so yeah, much yeah. kind of tourism of that way. Mm -hmm. And so um, mm -hmm. I put together a very, pretty long, maybe three pages, call, call for submissions um, document that said, you know, here's the book, we have room for this many pieces, they need to be about such and such words long, we'll come out, you know, planning for it to come out this year, we need them, we need the essays by this time, um, here's the title that I think it's going to be, mm -hmm. and here's my concept, and my concept was really, um, I wanted people to be able to write about food in a way perhaps that um, hasn't been welcomed in, you know, broader spaces outside of um, culturally specific spaces. And so if that was going to be about, you know, eating disorders, if that was going to be about um, um, you know, health issues, if that was going to be about uh, hot Cheetos. I bring that mm -hmm. up because one of the writers yeah. who really wanted to, but then ended up not being able to, she said, well, can I write about hot Cheetos? I said, yes, that's yes. exactly it. You don't have to write about mm -hmm. ancestral cuisine mm -hmm. or traditional mm -hmm. cuisine mm -hmm. or cuisines. You can if you want to. Um, but you can really approach this from any angle. It could be food sovereignty, it could be industrialized food systems, it could be your own garden, it could be, um, yeah, just really anything, mm -hmm. and especially anything you feel like is missing from the, the bigger conversation and or risk kind of responses to maybe questions or stereotypes that you've been subject to yeah. in Minnesota and beyond. Mm -hmm. um, and so, 
you know, also the art of the anthology is um, making sure the pieces, each piece offers something distinctive, right, from another one. Um, and for our potential readers, trying to provide something that's both broad but ha overall, right, that has mm -hmm. an overall focus and consistency. So it does feel like, oh, this does mm -hmm. belong in the same book, mm -hmm. even though these are people with different experiences. And that's, that's something that kind of emerges, but um, because, of, because of that, um, you know, of course, there were pieces that I didn't have room for, even though they might have been really wonderful. And that's also a good sign to me because yeah. no book is like yeah. the end, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. You yeah. hope What's that next? it's just, you know, <laughs> uh -huh. oh, well, yes, we need more mm -hmm. books. We uh -huh. need more voices. Mm -hmm. We need more essays. We need more. So um, to me, that was exciting, even though it's as an editor, it's really no one. Yeah, you don't like to say no to anything. You, um, but it was exciting to know that, yeah, lots of people are thinking about these things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I love how um, with sometimes, you know, it's coming from a background, you know, in, in higher education related to sort of religion and theology and those types of things. I mean, it's kind of like, like a mosaic and you're kind of working together, but mm -hmm. you're sort of orchestrating it, right? You're like mm -hmm. putting this, this picture together. Um, and, you know, one of, one of the things that from sort of a cultural perspective is that sometimes you know, having experience in higher ed, like they'll have like, oh, it's a taste of nations, mm -hmm. you know, event or something like that, that we really see as like the shallower, right? Mm -hmm. Cultural engagement, like that's the step one, mm -hmm. <laughs> cultural engagement. Um, but, but in terms of my experiences of food, you know, especially as relationships with people who are different from me are established over time, it really is through food where those deeper layers Mm -hmm. of um, uh, a cultural or racial, whatever, gendered experience, like, gets opened up mm -hmm. over and around food, and maybe it's at a table, maybe it's not, maybe it's in a car, I like, know. Mm -hmm. um, but really what, what you're doing is um, taking something that's so essential to daily life mm -hmm. and using that as, like, this entry point Mm -hmm. into just the whole complexity of life, you know, for immigrants and, right. and what they're experiencing. Right. I yeah. mean, you know, so many of my friends from refugee and immigrant families, um, depending on their family histories, they may not get a lot of family stories. There may be so much trauma that mm -hmm. there just yeah. hasn't, there isn't um, a way to use language all the time, right? And sometimes um, children and parents or children and grandparents don't, aren't speaking the same language fluently. Mm -hmm. And so that's another potential barrier. Right. Um, yeah. And so because it's something that if, you know, we are food secure, we get to do every day, it's something that, that most um, folks that I know found just so much richness, like you said, like there's ce the celebratory aspect, mm -hmm. there's, um, you, you know, food is involved in mourning rituals and loss and grief and um, just, you know, mostly for every occasion. It, it also was an opportunity for me to celebrate, you know, the experiences that I've had with my, you know, friends of um, from immigrant and refugee families and their incredible generosity and yeah. hospitality. Yeah. And, you know, all probably all human cultures throughout history have had hospitality, uh, hospitality kind of laws or norms, mm -hmm. right? And mm -hmm. so, yeah, breaking bread together or eating rice together. And then that means, you know, you're a guest and you have obligations just as the host is expressing their obligation to you and to welcome you and to keep you safe in, you mm -hmm. know, their uh, space. And so I really experienced that um, just from the people that I knew, and it felt like a real contrast to, you know, let's just say the 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 cooler social norms of mm -hmm. white people in mm -hmm. Minnesota or mm -hmm. many white people yeah. in Minnesota. Yeah, exactly. um, you know, there's there's the stereotype that Minnesotans don't 
like white Minnesotans don't invite you to their house. You could know someone for 20 years mm -hmm. and you've never seen the inside mm -hmm. of their house. Mm -hmm. and, and that's not because they're host you know, there's just a variety of things to that kind of um, norm. But I just found that the opposite in, um, you know, it was almost like the less folks had, the more open they were with it. And mm -hmm. I know that a lot of people who travel around the world, um, you know, who are used to like white middle class culture, which is pretty individualized, and they go other places and experience like, wow, those barriers are really broken down, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, um, and I, I couldn't get out of that home without eating something or drinking tea yeah. or, you know, yeah. it was just, yeah. it would be insulting for me to refuse yeah. their hospitality. So, yeah, yeah I w really wanted to have a space to try to, yeah, make that space for other voices um, and especially to have that emotional experience, explore those emotional experiences around food, you know, mm -hmm. for so many 1.5 or second generation people, there's a sense of loss. Mm -hmm. And, you know, some people write about how food really became a medium for getting to know more of their history. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, in, in my own um, experience, I was married to a Cuban American for 24 years. And so that's the Diaz, hence the Diaz. <laughs> Um, but just that whole experience of, you know, joining his family and being with his family, they um, left Cuba through Spain and were in Madrid for three years and then came over to Miami. And were welcomed there at that point by a relatively solid community, you know, but just thinking about that, going to a place where the language is spoken, where the food is pretty much available in terms of ingredients to buy, um, and, but just how much... Um, you know, in terms of the cultural expressions, you know, the importance and centrality of, mm -hmm. of food is so powerful. And just in terms of situations where my college roommate was Mexican American, you know, having these experiences of really living with people over time is where you really start to engage. You're developing those deeper friendships, as you're saying, to um, really understand the fullness of um, those stories and those experiences and, and what food has to do with it. And then and then throughout our marriage, living in different places, at one point we were um, four years living in Collegeville, um, mm -hmm. Minnesota. Mm -hmm. And you know, you become mm -hmm. best friends with um, the Cuban who owns the meat market, right? Mm -hmm. Like so, so you find those ways of connecting, even if it's just this little connection, right? Mm -hmm. That helps you hold on to that part of your identity. And then of course you become almost like family to them mm -hmm. right. <laughs> because those right. connections are so close. Right. Yeah. And so rare. It's almost like, especially when there's a scarcity of um, the language, the ingredients, and, and people, right, mm -hmm. from your experience, mm -hmm. that you really can hold on to those um, when you find them or see them. Right. Yeah. Right. I mean, most of us folks of color in Minnesota, um, just, you know, we come from more collective cultures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so the, yeah, the culture shock of coming to, especially like this northern Midwestern place where people are pretty private, where, and it just the whole, you know, Western system um, of privatization of mm -hmm. all kinds of mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. right? So, mm -hmm. yeah, and just the, um, the, the way, I mean, for me, the personal, part of the personal background of this project is how food has been a part of, you know, my cultural mm -hmm. journey um, as an adoptee and like lots of adoptees yeah. have, you know, one of the, one of the things um, that we've, that many of us have done to reconnect, understand, you know, Korean culture or wh whatever culture that, we came from, um, yeah, has been through learning the food ways. And then, I mean, when I, so I came over to the United States and I was about one and um, I, I don't know, I just was visiting with my mom um, this last weekend and she, I found out some more things about um, kind of my, my first several weeks, but I don't so I don't know when I started eating kimchi in okay. their household, but okay. I you know I know that I did, and I think um, 
yeah, she just had some more details to add. But from a very young age, like probably three or four, mm -hmm. I, I was eating kimchi. I was the only mm -hmm. person in my household of white people eating kimchi. I was really little. Um, I always, you know, wanted like rice and noodles for breakfast and I just mm -hmm. never and I still don't like American breakfast mm -hmm. to this day mm -hmm. doesn't really uh -huh. agree with me I don't like it yeah. you know and so that it's like that was just body memory that yeah. was just yeah. you know um, I had no like wow I need to reconnect with my culture so I need to eat kimchi and I'm four years old like you know and it's not it's not a food that any random four-year-old is just going to pick up and be like, right, oh, right. yeah, this is my favorite right, now. Yeah, like, it's yeah. often an acquired taste. Um, but I liked anything, like, pickled or fermented, you know, like, yeah, pickles. I'd be drinking pickle juice. Like, I was just, <laughs> you know, and I, I was all just, it was just instinct. Like, I, inscribed in you. Almost. Yeah, like, it was yeah. just instinct. Yeah. I had no um, instruction booklet, <laughs> you know. No. Um, I had no Korean adults around me. But, you know, my mom was really tried to do everything she could to mm -hmm. um, support my wholeness in that way. Yeah. So, um, yeah, that that is just something that um, really informs my yeah, respect of the place of food in a culture mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. how that physical memory um, and how for wellness, how as a society we can create conditions that support you know, spiritual, psychic, yes. and physical wellness. Yes, exactly. So whether it's, you know, yeah. I've had conversations with doctors about the food they serve in hospitals mm -hmm. and how when they have immigrant patients, um, you know, not from non, not from European places, mm -hmm. that they do better when they eat food that is culturally appropriate mm -hmm. or that is the food that they like, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those mm -hmm. kinds of things, I think, are just so important as we focus on um, that is treating people with respect mm -hmm. and not expecting everyone to conform. Um, and also, you know, just working through the thorny issues of appropriation mm -hmm. and um, industrialized food culture and monocropping and... Um, you know, land, number one. Yeah. And children's education, you know, most, many kids, urban kids and suburban kids, like, don't know that food grows out of the ground, you know, like, mm -hmm. how are we mm -hmm. going to, how are we going to survive, right, uh, as a species? Yeah. How are we going to yeah. regenerate? Yeah. It's our job to regenerate these ecosystems because as humans, we've, we're the ones despoiling them and, mm -hmm. um, a lot of that on this land has been for food, mm -hmm. you know, um, destroying the prairies for mm -hmm. cornfields. Mm -hmm. My mom lives across from a huge cornfield and next to a soybean field. You yeah. know, it's just like classic um, rural American white landscape. Mm -hmm. And she's someone who's just, that's just been her whole life. She grew up in Illinois, um, you know, in Chicago, mm -hmm. but yeah, it's not really questioned, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And it's also, I'm sure, I'm sure it's, you know, Monsanto corn or whatever, and she's surrounded by pesticides and, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, yeah, so it's just, mm -hmm. there's, there's no way, I think, to talk about so many issues without, you know, or we should be including and centering our food systems as well, mm -hmm. is what Diane Wilson and others um, really have taught me that I'm continuing to try to learn more about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you talked, I think, a little bit about um, a garden or gardening, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, the berries yeah. and yeah. having some of that. Do you still do that or no? Yeah, that, I do yeah. Um, as much as possible. Um, it's hard because if, you know, if you travel, even if you go out of town for mm -hmm. five or six days and don't water <laughs> your tomato, you know, they might it's a commitment. wither, yeah. you know, yeah. they need, yeah, they need care. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But I just harvested the last of the apples from the apple tree in my backyard and they're really gorgeous and beautiful. Mm. And, you know, and they're all different. It's just so amazing to experience 
the time, it's like a different way of experiencing time, right? Mm -hmm. To see the little, they start out as little green um, jewels in the beginning, or you know, they start as white flowers first and then they close and become this, this little fruit and then they grow and the organic, you know, homegrown experiences is each apple is like an individual, <laughs> you know, they're all different. Whereas you go to the store and for conventionally grown industrial apples, they're gonna all look exactly the same. They're all the same size, right? And so just even that experience is so profound, even in terms of thinking about our own being as mm -hmm. living beings, mm -hmm. right? That um, just, what can we learn from plants, right? Mm -hmm. What can we learn about our own wholeness, our own mm -hmm. kind of wilderness, mm -hmm. instead of constantly being forced to, um, yeah, fit into something that just makes it convenient for someone else who's trying to, yeah. you know, use us as for their own politics yeah. or their own wealth yeah. or, right? Yeah. So, yeah. Um, there's, we have, yeah, we just have so much to learn from plants. Um, so, yeah, Diane's spirit is just in the whole, her spirit and wisdom is in the whole book. Um, and anything that people don't like about the book is certainly not her fault. <laughs> <laughs> you know, she's not like, I didn't sign up to be the patron <laughs> saint of this <laughs> book. Like, am well, I getting inspiration? You know, yeah, Clearly. yeah. And she's just yeah. the best. Like, we yeah. have a new book together, which isn't on my um, yeah. bio yet, but if I can share, yeah, definitely. yes, yeah, I was anything. just because I'm so excited mm -hmm. um, that our new book just came out on Tuesday. We just had the book launch at Red Balloon Bookshop of where we come from, and it's co-written with Diane Wilson, Shannon Gibney, and John Coy, and it's illustrated by Dion MBD, and it picks up a lot of these themes oh, of nice. kind of, you know, how do we explore the idea, how do we as non-Indigenous people mm -hmm. um, explore the idea and, and live into the practice that we're all related? Um, what would that look like if we actually behaved that way mm -hmm. and behaved as though, you know, water was a relative mm -hmm. and not a resource mm -hmm. instead of calling things resources? Mm -hmm you know, we saw them as brothers, sisters, cousins, mm -hmm. relatives, you know, ones mm -hmm. that we liked. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ones that well, we just wanted that, to you avoid, know, we're right? we're made up so much of I water. I mean, we're 63% right? we water. We're, like, water. Yeah, we're just, just, we're water. We we're just it. bags of water um, after moving breath, around. After air, which is a part of us as well, yeah. we need water. That's the next yes. step um, in terms of our requirements for what, what it yeah. means for humans to be creatures right. on right. this planet. Right, and exactly. Yeah. So whatever we do to water, we're doing to ourselves. Mm -hmm. Whatever we do to our mm -hmm. food systems, we're doing to ourselves, mm -hmm. um, right? But mm -hmm. it's mostly indigenous and people of color communities that suffer the externalities of our, of mm -hmm. our food systems. Mm -hmm. um, and so in that sense, like the middle and upper class of the country can you know, they can afford to, whether it's buy your own bottled water or buy mm -hmm. organic mm -hmm. or, you know, so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. um, we have such a stratified, yeah, such a stratified mm -hmm. system. So mm -hmm. to be to be proximate or in community with people mm -hmm. who make so much just beauty out of so little, mm -hmm. you know, is also a lesson for, you know, thinking about just the excess of right. middle class consumerism. Right. and. Yeah. America wastes 40% yeah. of its food mm -hmm. total. I mean, it's just, you know, the more you dig into mm -hmm. it, the deeper you get into mm -hmm. it, the more it's just incredible mm -hmm. um, just mm -hmm. how toxic our society is in our systems. And so, yeah, I was, yeah, just and hoping these stories are ways for yeah. us to be inspired to, to do better, yeah. you know. So one of the other things, I, I know that you were, had some time in Chicago before you came to Minnesota, and I was more recently in Chicago. I've been over a year sort of shifting mm. to be in St. Paul, and now in St. Paul full-time for the last two months. And um, one of the things um, in terms of the education and the work, the justice work that was being done was around food deserts. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I had a student at one point doing research and writing on, um, you know, not, not only the reality of the food deserts and just act, lack of access, but also she was doing research on 
how stressful that is. And in this particular, she was looking at a black community in terms of the cognitive, the added cognitive load for young children who mm -hmm. are, you know, being educated and in schools. So it's on top of the other stresses. You have the stress of, you know, not having access to nutritious quality food and clean mm -hmm. water and or if it's the statistics in Chicago around um, you know immigrant especially Hispanic communities having to like feeling like they're not living by places that have soft, safe mm -hmm. wa safe water so they do buy bottled water mm -hmm. but that's a greater expense right mm -hmm. so um, there's there's so many layers to the justice piece here yeah. and when I just think about like gosh even something simple like our, our school lunch programs like that are under, are under attack or those types mm -hmm. of things that we see as that maybe for years have been sort of fundamental or basic are now, mm -hmm. you know, causing even more right. difficulty as those things are being. Right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, and I mean, bottled water can't be the way. <laughs> because, You're right, I mean, right. it takes so much water to make yeah. a plastic bottle, yep. right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Yeah, the... I, I learned from LaDonna Redmond, who's a local food activist, um, and, and others that actually they've, the field or the discourse has moved away from the term food desert into mm -hmm. the term food apartheid. Oh, yeah. You know, you which yeah. just makes it more clear mm -hmm. and especially brings mm -hmm. the association that, um, mm -hmm. at least in the United States, mm -hmm. it's, it's racialized, yeah. right? Yeah. But also because many people do live in deserts around the world and they're not barren mm -hmm. wastelands, right? Mm -hmm. There is life, mm -hmm. there are ecosystems and they um, you know, are naturally occurring whereas these spaces of food apartheid are certainly engineered by city planners, by banks, by governments, mm -hmm. by um, you know, the real estate yeah, uh, industry. Industry. Mm -hmm. So all of the, all of that uh, racial apartheid, which is really a form of ethnic cleansing, is also reflected in our food systems. And um, even so, you know, my white mom who lives in she grew up in Chicago, and then we lived in a suburb of Chicago, and then she got remarried later and moved out to this to the small town in western Illinois on the Mississippi mm -hmm. across from. Clinton, Iowa. And so even though there's food there, um, it's, it's not healthy food, mm -hmm. even though it's like, it may be generally like wholesome food. There's just, there's a lot of fried food. There's a lot mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, flour based food. There's not there's, well, what I should say, what there isn't is like, I, I couldn't order like a really good salad. I couldn't yeah. order like anything with non wilted green vegetables. Like, cause it's kind of a, kind of a, um, you know, it's a working class community and the menu's kind of in, from the fifties, um, you know, okay. um, sort of a meat and potatoes. So like, yeah. So the diet, the menu, that's sort of like stuck in a yeah. rut historically. So like yeah. 10,000 kinds yeah. of meat yeah. and, the, yeah. uh, uh, you yeah. know, and so yeah, people, it, people get sick, you know, people. Mm -hmm. um, so that was another, that was another um, experience. I hadn't been there since last year. And um, just thinking through like, oh, I really want some broccoli. I really yeah. need something green. Yeah. Yeah. I need some fiber, yeah. <laughs> you know? Well, yeah, because you shared that you've, how long have you been a vegetarian? Yeah, or? since I was 16. Yeah. 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 Um, but even if you were just someone who wanted like meat and then a lot of vegetables, yeah. you couldn't really get it. Mm -hmm. um, you'd have to put together or like ask the cook to do something different. So yeah, I was thinking about that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and it's interesting how like I've, um, I'm going through a lot of change in my life recently, an empty nester with four kids now that I've basically raised out of the house and just started like, about two months ago, and it kind of was a natural progression over about a you know a month prior to that, um, eating closer to a vegan way mm -hmm. of eating. But I just really like this is really what my body wants. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? So it is almost like I did start thinking at one point as I was growing up, like when you have you know the typical, um, well, and not even when I was very young, it wasn't um, typical in terms of having meat and like access you know to be able to purchase that those things, but like. When it got to the point where we could buy those things, you know, you eat your meat. Like you're sort of 
yeah. almost like you and you clear your plate because that right. food is precious. So right. I almost think like, gosh, I that I wouldn't have maybe gone that direction. Mm -hmm. That wouldn't have been my preference, maybe mm -hmm. to be eating that much meat. You know, maybe I would have eaten fish eventually or but it's just interesting to mm -hmm. think about that, like how sometimes too we're pushed into certain ways of eating that maybe isn't like what our body wants and mm -hmm. what are our preferences, but like just thinking about how, you know, your mother was like, yes, eat kimchi, you know, mm -hmm. and like, mm -hmm. and, and you sort of had that into it if that's what you leaned toward. It was like, well, I probably might not have leaned in that direction. Mm -hmm. um, so it's almost thinking about like how um, encouraging people to really, for me, it, you know, that was around some moralish, but more like just health, like I just feel better. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah. Overall. Um, and in terms of our environment, you know, clearly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah, the industrialized, especially cattle, beef industry mm -hmm. is really water intensive, mm -hmm. land intensive. Um, I mean, I, I was raised by someone who was raised by someone who grew up in the uh, depression, right? Or someone's who grew yes, up, a yes, whole generation yes. that grew up in the depression. Yes. And my grandmother um, grew up in a family of 12 in inner city Chicago only six of those children made it past the age of two. The six babies died of the flu, mm -hmm. you know. Right. Um, and my grandmother had to quit school in sixth grade and go work at a deli to support the family, right? And she never went back to school, and that was okay. There, were, I don't know if there weren't laws. That, there weren't laws. Mm -hmm. We didn't have law. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, and so of course, so she grew up with this real frugality. Real yes, like if you if meat is a dear is de you know was very dear, mm -hmm. um, and if you had that you were going to finish it and um, so yeah the whole kind of thing of like if you're at a restaurant you're gonna like take everything but the but the kitchen sink in your purse <laughs> home with you right like oh there's butter like it's going in my bag you know like and um, oh it's 90 degrees I'm not turning the air conditioning on until it's 93 you know that just mm -hmm. like that kind of thing like mm -hmm. even though she at, at some point could afford to you know buy, it's not like she couldn't afford her own butter at home mm -hmm. but it was like oh this I paid for this yeah. Um, and yeah. my mom wasn't like that like she adapted but um, it was definitely yeah, definitely seeing those kinds of, um, that generation. I think she was born in 1911, um, you know, 100, yeah, she would probably be 100 something now, um, is just to see how food is such a factor in how people, yeah, how people live when it's scarce, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Should we take? Is there are there any questions in the chat? Not at, at this point. Not at the moment. No. Okay. I'm. I know you had a question. Yeah. I, well, now it changed. So. <laughs> okay. Go. Um, <laughs> you mentioned, um, you know, food activism and, and trying to like centralize um, food sources and do it more sustainably and stuff. Um, are there? And this is something that maybe you could give us later, but are there resources or groups that like, if people watching this or people who are mm -hmm. familiar with Wisdom Ways were passionate about those events and were, mm -hmm. were causes and weren't really aware of, mm -hmm. do you have any groups you recommend? I do, or? I do. I mean, first and foremost, Dream of Wild Health, which yeah. is where Diane was the co-director for many years. And so um, that is, yeah, that's, she's just, done so many, um, done such good work. And um, she and Robin Wall Kimmerer, author of Braiding Sweetgrass and other mm -hmm. books, you know, recently did a talk or did a talk this summer at the U of M and people were asking like, what should I do? And what can I do? And what should I do next? And what should I focus on? And um, they both really said, observe. Yeah. They, instead of like, oh, well, dive into giving yeah. money here or there or, or yeah. you know, do this, that, or the other thing with legislation. Like they, it's not like they were saying we don't need mm -hmm. different types of advocacy and change, but they both said observe. I mean, observe the plants around you, whether it's your own garden or just in the neighborhood, mm -hmm. you know, pay attention. 
And once you start paying attention and once you start observing, you're going to notice things. And those, those plants are going to teach you things. Um, and of course, she goes deeply into that in, in braiding sweetgrass and her, she's got a book on moss and um, is doing other work. And Diane's book, most recent novel, is called The Seed Keeper. And it's all about, um, yeah, it's all about, it's, it's these several stories woven together and seeds are at the heart of it. And what in particular Dakota women did to save the seeds. Uh. Um, of and you know ancestral corn pre-colonial quote unquote corn corn and other seeds and how important and why they're important and took a whole novel to bring us through this um, really rich experience um, through storytelling of why it's important and then the other thing you know we're just we're facing so many global crises right mm -hmm. and yep. environmental catastrophes and so people some people asked um, what gives you hope <laughs> ask them get what gives you hope right and um, I always say like the middle class needs a lot of hope but um, <laughs> she said I don't know about hope but I do know about love mm -hmm. and it was like total mic drop moment of course yeah. and and so there, that message was really about, well, in, if you infuse love into your ways of being, mm -hmm. whether it's with your plants or with it, whether it's with your people, animals, you know, just you can't help but start learning things. And you don't, you know, she didn't say you don't need hope, but other activists that I know have said you don't, hope is a discipline or hope is a practice. You don't need hope. You just need to keep doing the things that you need to do to be a good ancestor, right, for the next yeah. generations. Um, and you can't change the past, but if we keep sharing stories, hopefully we'll continue to see that well, we're very, we're completely interdependent, right, and that we need each other, we need each other's stories, we need each other's, um, we need to, we need to understand the best ways of being. We just frankly need to follow Native women who've kept their people alive through the most uh, devastating of, you know, um, genocidal yeah, attacks just say, just say it. and, <laughs> yeah. and <laughs> ongoing, yeah. ongoing oppression and injustice. And so there's so much that the rest of us have to learn. Mm -hmm. I mean, from indigenous people around the world, um, the biodiversity of the world is really in the hands of indigenous people. And so um, just that, yeah, observing like at the daily personal level and then um, just learning and listening and um, I think thinking about whatever justice work we're trying to do as a practice as opposed to, of course, like there's some end. There's just, yeah, there's yeah. no end. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. The sense that it's, yeah, that it's a holistic practice that takes the whole self, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it takes the heart, it takes the strategic, it takes the embodiment. Mm -hmm. You know, it takes us, you know, anyone sustaining themselves, right? right? And making sure that they right. have the supports they need. And right. That, but I just, it's so beautiful how, um, and there were, uh, two, I think, at least two of the pieces in the book they really do talk about that food as that expression of mm -hmm. love, and that's one of the yeah. ways that this comes through. And it's in some ways by um, thinking about these questions really can formulate, you know, how do we relate to creation mm -hmm. through this? Yeah. Because it mean, really physically connects us, you know, right. we take in water, we take in food. Right. Um, that yeah. we are something that we are a part of. It's not like out there and we're exactly. here. It's actually, no. That's, yeah. We are it. Too. We are it. Yeah. yeah. Whatever we yeah. are eating that comes from the mm -hmm. ground or, mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's what we are. Mm -hmm. And so are we respecting that? I mean, so it's like even, even t you don't have to take on like a martyrish yeah. charity yeah. mindset. It's <laughs> literally, you know, are you... Do you, how much violence do you want to do to yourself? Yeah. Right. Like, yeah. how much harm do you want to continue to do to yourself? Um, 
And so just at that level, even if you're like, I don't care about anyone else. I don't care about justice. I yeah, yeah, where's the care about, you know, yeah. the next generations. Like if, yeah, if you even have a basic care for your own life force, right? Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, that's, that's really what, in some ways, fundamentally what we're about. Sometimes I joke that maybe Wisdom Way should be like a school of love, right? Or like, what is that, what would that mean? And, um, and how, how is that, that life force of love expressed through who we are, what we do, how we engage with other people, and, um, and, and really helping people, because most of our, the people who come to our program, you know, they are um, white, upper, class, you know, women who are, you know, 60 and older, but really mm -hmm. trying to say, okay, fine, continuing to meet um, those deep needs, but, but prompting a space of growth too. Mm -hmm. Because for me that it's, if I'm not growing, I'm dying, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? If there's not something challenging me or pushing me um, or like, or it's uncomfortable for me <laughs> or that I'm mm -hmm. getting like a little, um, yeah, just it's making me more expansive in mm -hmm. my capacity to love both myself and, and others and creation. So that's, it's really finding those ways to do that and mm -hmm. express it. And um, mm -hmm. I, I really think that this, um, it is an expression of love too, because it, as you say, sort of in, in your introduction, like it deals with, yeah, the celebratory pieces, but also the hard pieces, you know, mm -hmm. there's the stories of the funerals and stories of saying goodbye, um, stories of unrequited young love, you yes. know, stories it's of one of my favorite. Um, all these. Yeah, it's yeah. hard. I would never ask to pick a favorite because in some ways yeah. too, I'm like, yeah. oh, is it the taco truck story? Oh, right. is it the, right. you know, like, I know. There's so many stories that I just loved how like these artists just put them together. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's like a meal. Yeah, right? it like, is. <laughs> You know, and the, uh, the cover, I, I didn't binged notice it I binged it. <laughs> until um, maybe on my second, when we, were, when we were doing, you know, the cover process, I didn't notice, you know, until maybe the second time I saw it, that this is a cutting board and has knife marks oh, on yeah. it. You know, it's, yeah. it's not a plate or, yeah. uh, but that, yeah, yeah, so this is like, we prepared this meal <laughs> for yeah. our, you know, a community, for our readers, um, mm -hmm. so that we could be in communion, you know. I was raised Catholic, like you're you're literally eating Sharing your God, yes, right? Like exactly. you're literally yes. you're <laughs> drinking the God's blood, right? Like yes. you are becoming one in that way. And this the 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 spiritual hunger is mm -hmm. the same as right the physical hunger. Right, right. But listen, these the white women in their sixties with some resources, yeah. baby boomers own forty three percent of the wealth in this country. Oh wow, it's a lot. See, I haven't heard it put that way before. That's I mean, let's, yes, yeah. and Gen X owns some wealth. That's my generation. Actually, owns more wealth than millennials, even though there's like a hundred million more millennials. But because of you know the wars, housing prices, yeah. oh, that, 2008, <laughs> everything, right? Yeah. Um, so white women have so much power. White mm -hmm. women with some resources, um, and even without resources, but in terms of people who come, get to come to lectures or who get to focus on their spirituality, you know, or who get to read books for leisure and get together and think about ideas. Like that group of people has tremendous power in this country to shift conversations, to, you know, follow the leaders of color and native leaders that we need to follow, um, to fight patriarchy, right? Like I would never, I would, I never write off you know, um, white women over the age of 60, um, even though our patriarchy wants to invisibilize them, right? Or any woman right, over the right. age of 32, yeah. Yeah. right? But just increasingly more mm -hmm. past, the more past 32, or if, you know, in Leonardo DiCaprio's world, if you're over 25, you, <laughs> your, you, your expiration date, you know? But yeah, uh, the white women, over the age of 60, middle class, upper class, upper middle class, um, need to mobilize those mm -hmm. resources. They have, they have a tremendous amount of power. Mm -hmm. They've just been, you know, some of them have been duped into thinking they have no power because mm -hmm. men have more power. Mm -hmm. White men have more power than they do, but um, 
No, because white men, white women have been participating in upholding white supremacy this whole time, hundreds of years. You know, so not only do they have the opportunity, they have the obligation to, you know, get in, get in there and mm -hmm. get their hands dirty or, you know, follow. Yeah, just support, support the leaders who are in communities and know what they're doing. Right. 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 Um, as we, yeah, right. so we all can do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. Um, I was. I also want to just, and I don't know if there's any other questions in the chat to open that up, but I, d I did want to address a little bit. I was so, um, you know, pleased in a sense because I actually, well, I have um, two children in the Twin Cities and a daughter particularly who's more involved um, at the community level. And we, we spend time talking about mutual aid mm -hmm. and that possibility. And I, you had a piece on that, you know, or that mm -hmm. addressed yeah. that. So maybe, because I think for a lot of people, that's maybe even a new concept, like in terms of um, just people caring for each other and right. just all the mapping that's gone on around that and that whole process. I don't know if you, you know, would like yeah. to talk about that a little bit just to help people understand what that is. And um, I mean, I'm definitely not an expert mm -hmm. on that, but I... Um, yeah, Simi Kang wrote about that and the tradition of langar in the Sikh community and the Sikh religious yeah. tradition, and it's in, just incredible. Um, and also, she's done a lot of work in Louisiana with Vietnamese uh, fishermen and ecological changes that have affected their ability to, you know, continue their livelihood. And I mean, what I would say about the mutual aid movement and maybe a parallel or intersecting movement of community reparations, community yeah. reparations mm -hmm. models, is that um, these are, of course, old ideas that people are recuperating mm -hmm. and, yeah. and adapting mm -hmm. for our own times. Um, the, I, I, the authors, the contributors to this book, I really have just extra tenderness for because I was asking for these stories to be completed and sent to me you know, shortly after May 25th, 2020. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just a lot to ask of people, yeah. you know. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, I, I, I have this project yeah. I love. I want, yeah. us, I want to get all these voices out. And yet I hate to ask you to do any more labor than you're already doing. Yeah. Um, and so definitely some of them were engaged in mutual aid. And of course it's, it's you know, George Floyd's murder has affected people in different ways, right? I would never say it's affected everyone in the same way. Um, but the mutual aid movement or movements, we have so much to learn from. I think mm -hmm. also intersecting with disability justice mm -hmm. movement and just social models right. of, whether it's social models of disability, social models mm -hmm. of um, food systems, uh, and you know, getting away from medical models, getting away from privatized everything, right? And I mean, private property, it's the land. So if we have private property of the land as our basic economic system, um, we have to find ways to, you know, ways in to start dismantling that, you know, building up other things. So the mutual aid movements to me seem like ways of either bypassing the border, you know, the boundaries of um, private property ways of thinking and ways of being and ways of, sh you know, not sharing. Um, so all of that to me seems like revol like ongoing part of revolution of just people's movements, right? Mm -hmm. Of right. just people yeah. trying to yeah. survive. Mm -hmm. um, the nuclear family is a failure, a si failure of a system, right? Um, all the kinds of things that have supported the typical types of white wealth building um, in this country are, are toxic, mm -hmm. are and failures. And prevented other you know, right. people of color from building wealth. You know, so right. there's the, the supports and then the preventive, yeah. So, you know, mm -hmm. Ruth Wilson yeah. Gilmore, who's yeah. an abolitionist and scholar, mm -hmm. she says that you know, capitalism needs inequality to function and racism enshrines inequality. And so that's why we have to look at everything together. We can't just, of course, we'll have people have expertise, right, mm -hmm. and depth. But we, 
as communities just can't silo ideas off. We can't yeah. think, okay, this system yeah. is this, this system is this. Like, no, we have to think about them all together. Mm -hmm. And we, we have to always be talking about and working on racism because racism makes all these other inequalities possible, right, um, in our racial capitalism. Yeah. Wow. I, I feel like I could go on for another hour. <laughs> I think this is good. This is juicy. No, I, these, these yeah, people, I just, their stories you know, are so good. Yeah. Yeah, I have like a million questions right now. But I just want to say too, like is there anything you really like feel like you want to just express or say or get across anything from this book? I'm so excited. There's a new piece. I can't wait to, yeah. to go read it. The new um, book, you know, maybe it'll get banned. I've got my I Read Banned books pin on. Yeah, it'll um, get banned. And then it might get banned because we talk about evolution. I mean, it's mm. like that's heretical and, you know, according to some people. Our first line is, we come from stardust, you yeah. know, and so yeah. just trying to, oh. yeah, so, so how are we together? Let me just say that as someone who was raised Catholic also, um, the Pope Francis's encyclical Laudate Si, which came out in 2014, 2015, says that in like the opening section. Oh my gosh. We come from the start. We come from stardust. Mm -hmm. We're all of the same elements. I should have gotten the so Pope to blurb you, our book. Yes, what was yes. I? I will, I will send you that Marion, you held back <laughs> on me. Laudato Si. You, yeah. Where were you three <laughs> months ago? That should not be an issue, <laughs> <laughs> at least for some the Pope should be opening for our next reading. That's right, yeah. that's right. He has a very cosmic vision. <laughs> but it's so true, that. right? Isn't yeah. that weird? Right? Yeah. That we do feel like we're in a culture where, oh, that's gonna be an issue. Right. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we're we're in we're in strange times. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. But thankfully we have these beautiful people <laughs> guiding us back to what's important. It's just, yeah, my main thing is like what a g I just feel so um yeah, really blessed to get to work with people's words. Mm -hmm. It just feels really special. Yeah, yeah. Well, I would just want to say as we're closing down, just, you know, pick it up, read it. And, and the other book, too, the other anthology, <laughs> the new text, too, as well, we'll have links in the description of the YouTube video when this is up so you can go look for it. And you know, one of the things I'm thinking about um, for Wisdom Ways, and we also, with the Sisters of St. Joseph as our sponsor, they also sponsor like a community garden. Um, we have Project Home, which is next door to us, which um, allows homeless, you know, has homeless people staying. Um, and so we're really looking at like these issues, trying to look at these issues in a holistic way. And I just love how like even coming together um, from different experiences and sharing around food stories mm -hmm. could be really um, yeah. a solid way of opening. And I think, like, for example, we have a lot of students at St. Kate's yes. who are women of color, who are immigrants yes. or different experiences. And, um, yeah, just getting some of them together, like, hey, what food do you miss? Or doing some mm -hmm. events or cooking around it, too, mm -hmm. would be yeah. great to help um, continue to open up the richness of what mm -hmm. you've created for us. So. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Thank you, Marion. Thank you so much. Yeah. For being Thank here. you so much for your questions.